Welcome to Tenther Tuesday. This is episode number 30. My name is Michael Bolden. I'm joined by... Michael Meharry. Mike, today's the day 425 that the GOP has failed to get rid of Obamacare as promised by, of course, so many Republicans and the president. And even worse, the president, uh, his administration, at least uh, HHS, is now pressuring the state of Idaho to fully enforce the Affordable Care Act because they've been trying to opt out of some provisions. Now, you've done a full report on this. We have the letter published uh, from HHS to uh, the Idaho governor and lieutenant governor out on the website right now at 10th Amendment Center dot com. But before we get to that, I want to cover two really big bills that were uh, went into law just over the last couple of days. Actually, uh, just yesterday, first of all, in Michigan, the Fourth Amendment Protection Act, for those of you who've been following our work for a number of years, this is one of our signature campaigns to turn off material support or resources to warrantless federal surveillance. House Bill 4430, Mike, that one just went into law. Did it go into effect yesterday as well? It's uh, I, I think it's a 90 days. OK, 90 days from from the uh, signature. OK, so uh, give us a little overview of what the what's going on there. So effectively, what Michigan has done is is they're banning all material support to warrantless surveillance. And that includes uh, collecting data for the feds, giving data to the feds, taking data from the feds uh, if it is collected warrantlessly. And it's a pretty, pretty solid bill. Uh, I was very pleased with the way the language evolved as it went through the process. Uh, the sponsor there, uh, Representative Horlack, was able to deal with some of the uh, the objections that you knew were going to come up uh, in a way that did not water down the bill. And so what we've got is is a really strong law that will go on into effect this summer, essentially banning all support and resources to warrantless federal surveillance. So if uh, if it's unconstitutional, if it's warrantless, uh, the state of Michigan will not be helping. Now, so. does it, it from my reading of the of the the new law, that's House Bill 4430 in Michigan, it's actually stronger. So it's the second state now that has taken a step right. like this. It's actually significantly stronger than what passed here in California. Senate Bill 828 a couple of years ago when Obama was in office, that was from um, uh, State Senator Ted Lieu, who's now in Congress. Uh, that bill, it actually, it it required a kind of a determination of, of of constitutionality or what's next. They had to say, okay, this is now, like it's on the books in California, but in order to actually come into practical effect, it needs follow-up to say, okay, now this is what we're applying it to. Uh, from what I'm reading in Michigan, it basically is just saying, hey, if the feds are doing warrantless surveillance, we're not going to help them out or participate in that. Is that correct? It doesn't have yeah, to have a judge say, okay, this is unconstitutional first. That, that's exactly correct. So effectively, it is it kind of the opposite approach of the way California did it. So the way California's law is written, if a determination is made that the warrantless surveillance is unconstitutional or it's, if it's illegal, then the state is going to stop uh, in that enforcement. The Michigan bill is the other way around. It says that we are not going to cooperate in warrantless surveillance collection at all unless these certain criteria exist. So uh, the, 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 Status quo is we're not helping with warrantless surveillance, and then they put some exceptions in to allow sharing of data. You know, for instance, if the uh, State Department of Revenue has to share information with the IRS, things like that that would go on in the normal course of, of business between the state and federal government. They carved exceptions out to allow that information to be exchanged, but the uh, the foundation, the status quo, is we're not helping with the gathering of, of information. I think this is an important part of how federalism is supposed to work under the Constitution. Uh, the states don't, and the people on top of it, they don't need to have a federal judge tell them, okay, the way that the California law went, went into, uh, into effect here is totally opposite of what the founders set up. That is, uh, the California law basically said, well... If the federal government tells us that the federal government is doing something wrong, then we're going to stop helping the federal government. Well, you don't need the federal government to tell you that you don't have to. And even if somehow right. someone could make the case that mass warrantless surveillance of everybody basically on Earth is right. somehow uh, it, it, somehow it drives with the Constitution, somehow that's all OK, then 
you don't have to participate in that. Basically, Michigan is saying, we're not going to help you. We don't like this, so we're not going to participate in this. And we want to see more states take that action going forward. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think that's an important uh, point to emphasize that a state doesn't have to cooperate. It doesn't matter whether it's constitutional or not. You know, and, and even back in Federalist 46, when Madison gave us the government commits a warrantless action or something that's unconstitutional that the state could step in. But then he also said they could do the same thing for a warrantable action, right. something that's completely constitutional if it just happens to be unpopular. And the courts have upheld that for 176 years. So, you know, the state of Michigan is not obligated, even if, some, like you said, even if somebody were to come along and be able to prove that warrantless surveillance is A-OK, -okay, the, the state of Michigan still is not under any obligation to cooperate with that uh, that federal effort at all. So this is a great bill. It's it's legally sound, and uh, you know it's it's going to be effective. And it's I'm very excited this passed. We put a lot of work into this over the last year. Well, I was just going to say that, Mike. I know you have personally spent a lot of time on yep. this, and uh, probably without that, not to say. Every piece of the puzzle was essential. Uh, so right. uh, Representative of Michigan, uh, the people who uh, supported the bill that didn't sponsor it, uh, activists like Dennis Marburger, okay. Shane Trejo, uh, you know, but it, each one of these pieces have been essential. People making phone calls in support of the bill on the committee level. This is all absolutely important. But, uh, you know, we got this one to the finish line and signed. Yep. So that's huge. Fourth Amendment Protection Act, now law. Or, uh, will go into effect this summer in Michigan, House Bill 4430. And quickly to mention, a similar bill is already passed the state house in Missouri by a vote of 136 to 1. It's now in committee on the Senate side. That's House Bill 2104. We'll be watching that going forward. If you live in Missouri, call your state senator and tell them you want to see House Bill 2104 get to the governor. So that's House Bill 2104 in Michigan. One other bill I want to talk about, and then we need to get back to Obamacare because this is really important. Uh, on sound money, uh, the Wyoming Legal Tender Act, I guess. Is that the official name? I don't know. I think that is. The the Wyoming, I think that's what they call it. House Something bill, like that. Yep. House Bill 103 uh, went into law without the signature of uh, Governor Meade last week sometime. Uh, give us an overview of that bill. So this is a bill that, uh, first off, it declares gold and silver as legal tender and effectively puts it on par with Federal Reserve notes in the state of Wyoming. So it's considered exactly the same as money, which it is. And then uh, the effective part of the bill is it prohibits any taxation on gold and silver specie whatsoever. So no state income taxes, no capital gains taxes, no property taxes, no taxes at all. It treats it just like money should be treated. As Ron Paul said, we should not tax money. It's, a, it's absurd. And uh, so this bill in Wyoming takes a very, very solid first step at establishing sound money in the state of Wyoming. And, you know, as we've been saying, the important thing is here now, we've got this foundation set. The important thing is is for people to start using gold and silver. Take advantage of this. It's now cheaper and easier for you to uh, acquire gold and silver in the state of Wyoming. You can start using that in transactions to companies like Gold Money or the uh, metal. I can't even remember the name of the company. UPMA.org, United Dollar. Precious Metals Association. We actually just did one of our weekly featured videos on mm -hmm. both Gold Money and UPMA, basically talking about how you can have a, uh, a Visa or MasterCard logoed uh, debit card you put your your gold or silver on account. This is not an uh, not a Federal Reserve Bank. No. You're basically putting in this gold depository uh, in either Utah or Gold Money. I'm not sure where they're based. And then you can do you can do regular transactions wherever anybody takes Visa or Mastercard. You're basically just cashing in your sound money if you want to spend it. Some people want to hold it. Uh, personally, if you really believe in it, one approach might be to spend and replenish. Every time you spend, uh, you know, calculate how much you spent and then go buy more and then continue continually uh, uh, keep recycling uh, more sound money through the system. And the more that people do this, uh, the more likely that other people will learn that this is a better way to preserve your money in the face of constantly depreciating fiat. Right. 
And the good thing about these companies is, you know, they they operate on a 100% reserve basis. So, you know, if you own three ounces of gold, there are three physical ounces of gold and you can redeem, you know, your electronic account. You can go get those three ounces of gold. So it's not like you know the the bank where where there may or may not be actually money in their backing uh, the deposits that they say are there. These uh, companies are one hundred percent reserve. The gold is there. It's physical, real money, and uh, you know it's important that we begin creating these, whether it's through gold and silver, whether it's through cryptocurrency, to start utilizing these alternative means of of wealth storage and uh, business transaction. Uh, because the the Federal Reserve System is shaky, to say the least. Well, and on top of it, uh, their money printing is what empowers the empire, the imperial American presence in hundreds of locations around the world, all kinds of unconstitutional programs and agencies. If you don't like the ATF or the DEA or the Department of Education or whatever it may be, you don't want these people to have the money to do it. So the best way to strangle them is to not participate in their monetary system or barely scratching the surface, but hopefully uh, decades down the line, people can look back to this as the start of something yep. uh, that undermined that entire system. So House Bill 103 is uh, a law in Wyoming. I think it goes into effect sometime in June or so. Now, mm-hmm. this is there's a lot of momentum on the sound money issue. Uh, really is. we, we reported on uh, Senate Bill 156, which removed sales taxes uh, from uh, gold and silver in Alabama's law. And then this also helped resurrect a bill that's been sitting around for a year. And then another one got filed in the Senate in Kansas. Senate Bill 437 just passed out of committee there as well. And that just, Mike, is that uh, to deal with uh, taxes again? Uh, yep. Yeah. The uh, Kansas bill is, is sales tax. So it was just like the Alabama bill. Okay, and if you really want to keep up on this, and I think we're going to do, I have an idea, this is me sharing it with you, Mike, more than anything, <laughs> is I think, so we do an annual report over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report, but I think what we should do over the summer when we don't have a lot of bills to report on, I think we should start doing kind of just status updates. Hey, here's what's been going on on sound money, and then yep. just kind of do an update, and then as we add to it by the end of the year, it'll make our work easier, yours more than mine, yep. uh, because we'll have done all the reporting through the years and just through the months and just uh, updating at the end of the year. So stay That's a great tuned. idea. And, and to do it, you know, announce I it hope publicly, so. you know, that makes us accountable. And so now everybody's going to go, yep. hey, where's those reports you promised? Well... So. <laughs> Yeah. We'll see. Okay, back to Obamacare. Uh, (laughs) It's not just California that's in the crosshairs uh, 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 of the federal government. So uh, the Trump administration, should we say pressuring or threatening? I don't know what the right term. I think pressuring is probably the right term. I think pressuring because, you know, it's interesting as I'm looking at this, there really isn't a whole lot that uh, the, the federal government can do to Idaho in particular. You know, they, they can't find Idaho. They can't arrest Idaho. They're not going to send the National Guard, I guess it would be the U.S. Army, into Idaho to make them enforce Obamacare. Uh, they're but, not doing that on uh, to California either. No, that's true. But it's a lot of it's a lot of hot air from Washington D.C. federal really lawsuits, is. press releases. They're really not doing what a lot of people think they're doing, although they are. They did send a very aggressive letter to uh, to Idaho, the the governor and lieutenant governor, about this proposal. Mike, give us first, give us an overview of what the proposal is, what Idaho is trying to do, uh, what's going on before the letter got sent. So, like a lot of states, the Obamacare system in in Idaho is falling apart. You've got premiums that are way too high for, for your average person to afford. Uh, you know, it's, got, it's getting to the point that even if you're getting the subsidies, it's difficult to afford the premiums on these policies. So the state of Idaho finally said, you know what, we're going to step in. We're going to try to create some alternatives for people. And uh, basically what they did was loosen the insurance regulations in the state to allow uh, insurers to offer non-compliant Obamacare policy so that they, you know, they could have restrictions on some uh, uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, they would be allowed to not cover all of the various things, all of the mandates that are in the Obamacare law. And, uh, you know, basically allow them to create uh, these, uh, what they call them, catastrophic kind of policies that cover you when yeah, you Yeah, that are way you know, cheaper. That you can right. add more a la carte. Now, this is basically the weed strategy. That's what happened here in California right. uh, throughout the 90s, and it's, it's basically happening in a couple dozen states around the country where they're saying, uh, well, even though the feds are going to say you can't do this 
we're going to authorize you to do it anyways under state law. Um, it's up to you. Risk it if you want to. So the big question that you and I had, and this was quickly answered, was uh, on, on weed, it, it's less surprising that there were some individuals and well, it's going right. to be some pretty big businesses. And that's pun is in the pun is intended there. But yeah. there are some big business uh, uh, ventures there in the, the marijuana industry. But at first it was mostly individuals, small business that were right. taking the risk because they really believed in that freedom to, to uh, have uh, your own what you consume. It's your personal choice. So people believed in this, or they really needed it for health reasons, to cancer right. treatment, whatever it may be. And they risked the arrest, and many people were arrested. Mm -hmm. um, but on Obamacare, it's not too many. There's not too many small businesses or individuals that can provide catastrophic health care uh -huh. insurance. So that was the question. Okay, well, this is nice in theory, but will anybody do it? And then we found out pretty quickly that someone was willing to do it. Yep, Idaho Blue Cross stepped up and and. Really, it was really fast, too. And, and uh, what they said when they announced it is they plan to have some of these policies available as early as April. So, you know, and, and this is where the, the federal pressure is coming. The pressure is not really on the state of Idaho so much as it's on the insurance company because the insurance company is who they're threatening to actually find. Uh, I, I think the way I read it is that the, uh, the Health and Human Services, which actually it's the Medicaid, Medicare part of Health and Human Services that's enforcing this, uh, they could actually uh, fine Blue Cross uh, $100 a day for every non-compliant policy. Now, the interesting thing is, is they're going to have to, you know, they can't just say, okay, we're fining you. They actually have to do an investigation. Mm -hmm. There has to be due process. So the question in my head is, does this agency actually have the resources to do the investigation to mm -hmm levy the fines and then enforce collection on them. I, you know, I don't know. I do have a very strong gut instinct that if three or four other states were to follow Idaho's lead, yeah. that it would soon become very, very difficult for the Health and Human Service Agency to actually enforce its will. So the question is, will Idaho, will Blue Cross, will they back down? And, you know, it's interesting. I, th I think you were talking about the, the marijuana in California and, you know, people believed in it. People wanted it. They needed it. Uh, I wonder how much pressure the insurance companies, I'm just speculating off the top of my head, but how much pressure are these insurance companies feeling knowing that, you know, their business model is being destroyed by this federal program? And you have to wonder if there's not some incentive on the other side for them to say, you know what, if we don't offer some other products, we're going to go under. Uh, I, I wonder how that dynamic might be playing into things as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, I, I know in the letter, and Mike, do you covered this a bit in your report, basically, uh, the Trump administration letter basically said, okay, well, we don't agree with the law, but right. we got to enforce it. And that's exactly what it said. I, in fact, I thought it was kind of funny because the entire first page of the letter was basically making Idaho's case, you know, that Obamacare's failing and, uh, you know, they actually, the this federal is a cop government- out. Has, This is a cop out. They could do the, the right total, thing or they can do the out. wrong thing. The right thing is to support the constitution. That's the law they should be enforcing. That's the one they should be following no matter, and like uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, took the position. I mean, even if the Supreme Court says something. You don't have to obey the Supreme Court. Right. They can be wrong. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, not the pronouncement of these uh, unelected, unaccountable, uh, politically connected lawyers that make it the Supreme Court. So the Trump administration does not have to do this. They no. have a, a very incorrect view of, of what their duty is. Their duty is to the Constitution, no matter what anybody says. So they could easily say uh, nothing. And this is that, you know, that gets to a point that really irks me. And, and you see it a lot. Uh, I guess you probably see it a lot on both sides of the political spectrum. But I notice it a lot on the right, this this whole law and order mentality. Well, you know, we don't like it, but but it's got to be enforced. It's the law. Well, like you said, whatever happened to the Constitution, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And this whole idea that, you know, Federal supremacy, that the federal federal supremacy means that the federal government gets to do whatever the federal government says it wants to do is, is an absurd view of supremacy. And uh, I touched on this in an open letter I wrote to a Kentucky state rep or a Kentucky state senator who's who's fighting against medical marijuana because the feds won't let us do it. And, you know, it made me think of our, our good friend, Robert Scott Bell. Stop asking. What was this me. guy's name? Uh, his name is Albert Robinson. He's Wait, a, uh, so Republican. he's he's, he's saying. Republican. 
he's outside of the federal supremacy issue that supposedly the well the feds do make the claim that you can't do this right even even the obama administration which actually used more resources for enforcement than bush and clinton combined sure. in just one term uh they all take the position that well federal law is supreme in all situations and uh marijuana is illegal in, in the federal government and they are just making strategic resource choices when they back off on enforcement now this state senator in kentucky might be an idiot because he might be <laughs> i don't know what he's noticing but in a couple dozen other states they're doing it and right? Kentucky could easily do it as well. Uh, so either this guy is just a total wuss or he's a liar. I mean, yeah. I, I think, think your likes, letter your letter was likes, very professional. But I these think he likes people, the state police a lot. These people are <laughs> just dirtbags. I'm sorry. Anyways, uh, so— I don't disagree. So <laughs> you're, you're much kinder than I am. I don't like that guy. I don't no, like well, these— Well, somebody's got to be professional around here. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. So— uh, <laughs> Uh, the Trump administration is pressuring the people of Idaho. The, I don't. Did they send a letter to Blue Cross as well? Do we know that? Uh, we do not know that. Okay. I, I, I would. I don't know. I, I'm not going to assume. Well, I, I know head, they I sent the letter. Did, they but. sent the letter to uh, the lieutenant governor and the governor of Idaho. Maybe they. Well, that might be indicative of something. We know that a lot of enforcement, for example, like EPA, most of the enforcement for environmental, federal environmental regulations in almost every state is handled by states. Right. There's, there's nothing being done by the EPA in right. most states. So maybe they're telling, well, you Idaho government people better get on this or it's going to look bad on you when we start uh, sending out. I mean, they can definitely issue paperwork to do fines. I'm sure they have enough right. people to do that. But you never know. Uh, the, so. issue, the essence of the letter was, this serves as your notice. We don't believe you're fully enforcing this as you should. It is our desire for the state to enforce federal law in this case. But if you don't, we're going to step in and you have 30 days to address this issue or we're going to take further action. That was the essence of the, of the letter. Was it specifically 30 days? It was 30 days. Okay. 30 so days from the day of the letter. Okay, well, I'll just have to be following up. I'm going to try to pull this thing up and see what the date of that letter was. I want to say it was March 6th or 9th. I've got it here on View on Scribd, uh, March 8th. March 8th. Well, I was wrong. So it went to the, uh, uh, the governor of Idaho, Otter, and then the director of the Idaho uh, Department of Insurance. Because, of course, as we've noted for quite a while, it's the state departments of insurance that actually handle the enforcement of Obamacare in the states. So uh, if a state like Arizona, which I believe is the one who has this on the books, mm -hmm. that bans the State Department of Insurance from actually handling enforcement. I'm not sure if Arizona actually passed that or if Georgia actually did, I think. No, it was in that it was in the Georgia Obamacare bill, and that permission provision got stripped mm. out. At the okay, last. so this is a very important step to actually ban your state from helping. Yeah, why is your state helping uh, enforce Obamacare? Well, at least in Idaho, they're taking action to not help out, and we'd like to see them hold fast. And maybe another state will do the same. Uh, and I want to emphasize this. The, the letter didn't really threaten Idaho at all. There, it never did say that you can't do this, that you have to enforce this. All it said was, we want you to enforce this, and if you don't, we're going to do it. Now, the $64,000 Hey, I've been in passive-aggressive relationships <laughs> in the past. Uh, Sarah is wonderful, uh, and I don't get that. But basically, this I, is a passive-aggressive, uh, really aggressive move. Uh, you know, we're not telling you you got to do anything, but if you don't, we, you know, we might follow up and take other actions. Well, then again, it might be uh, the mall cop version, which is, if you don't stop, we'll say stop again. And that's right. what they did for years on the Real ID Real Act. ID. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how this plays out. We'll be watching that uh, early April, uh, I guess the April 8th or so. Don't expect yep. a government to be on time with a follow-up, <laughs> but you never know how right. serious um, the Trump administration is about enforcing all federal acts, most of which shouldn't exist in the first place, especially yep. the Affordable Care Act. And we'll be uh, following up on this show, and probably, uh, I'm assuming you'll do a, a follow-up blog at some point. Yeah, so uh, I want to cover some other legislation here. Uh, 
some positive news. Uh, what I considered probably the surprise of the month, maybe the legislative session, a really good bill passed in the Maryland House, House Bill yep. 314. So a lot of good legislation gets filed in states like Maryland, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Texas, New Oklahoma, York. New York. A lot of really good ones actually get introduced, especially on privacy uh, in the, the left, left-leaning or the blue states, and then on gun rights in the, the red states like Oklahoma mm-hmm. and Texas. But they almost never go anywhere uh, because the majority of the political party in charge really— they hate the Tenth Amendment, they hate the Constitution, they hate your liberty, and those bills never see the light of day. Uh, sometimes bills in Maryland get out of committee, but almost every time they attach an amendment to it and it turns into total junk, or they say, well, we're going to make this a study committee, right. uh, and a study bill, and a study bill is one that actually has the same essence of the bill, but it doesn't go into effect. They just create a committee to, to study what would happen if they did that. Then you never get a follow-up. So when I saw House Bill 314, which uh, prohibits the use of stingrays for warrantless surveillance or location tracking, uh, it went uh, it got out of committee. I didn't actually see any amendment there, but then I noticed as I was going through uh, legislation that I track on a regular basis, I noticed that it passed second reading, uh uh-oh, with an amendment, and the amendment wasn't published right away. So it passed a third reading, and I sent it to you, Mike, as you know, uh, through our our Podio app uh, with a task to actually look into it, and you came back and told me— They actually made it better. Yeah, this almost never happens. Almost never happens. Yeah, so they took a bill that, that initially uh, banned warrantless use of stingrays. And with the amendment, it actually completely bans using stingrays to intercept uh, communication information. So it could only be used for tracking, and that's with a warrant. So that would put it on par with the Illinois bill, which I've always kind of held up as the, uh, the, the best bill that we have or the best law we have in the country right now relating to stingrays. So very, very surprised. And then... Then uh, when I did the report initially, the uh, vote total wasn't up, and uh, I was shocked when you told me what the vote total was in the House. 102 to 35. It passed yeah. very easily out of the the Maryland House, House Bill 314. Totally prohibits the use of stingrays to collect electronic data, uh, and then requires a warrant if they're going to use it for location tracking. Now, warrant based on probable cause. If you've got someone who you've got probable cause to believe is committing crime, you might want to track them and and catch them. I guess that seems pretty acceptable. Uh, Usually, uh, police can't be trusted or governments can't be trusted and expand on this, but this is a significant step forward should it pass into law. Uh, now, stingrays, as we know, Mike, the, the, the quick overview, they... They mimic cell phone towers. So you just imagine that, the, that your uh, local cop has a cell phone tower in his car. He turns it on. Every electronic device within range of that police car uh, connects to the stingray device instead of the cell tower. And from there, that uh, officer can identify all of the various phones that are uh, connected to it and can track their location and in certain cases can even access the data on the phone. That would include text messages, internet browsing, and voice communications. Yeah, so it's basically uh, spoofing the cell tower, uh, intercepting all that data, and then passing it back to the cell tower so you don't know. You're making a phone oh, call yeah, to somebody, know. and it, like it's be- going past through. And this is very similar to what I had read from the Snowden documents a couple of years ago. There's this process... And I'm not sure if they're still doing it or if this was an old program, but it wouldn't surprise me. Basically, the NSA had built a system to intercept UPS shipments of specific routers that were being shipped to consumers. Uh, The shipment would be intercepted. It would be sent to a facility somewhere in central California if it was a West Coast shipment going overseas, for example. They would intercept it, open the package install some malware, spying malware on it, reseal it like from the factory, get it back on a UPS truck, and your tracking would never be the wiser and it would yep. still get delivered on time. Now, I don't I don't know if that's real or <laughs> it sure seems crazy, but it's basically yeah. the same thing. They're doing this behind the scenes to to tr- to basically spy on people, collect stuff, take it out of the system that we're counting on it being in. 
uh, all without a warrant, and that's bad news. But the positive news is that uh, Maryland, at least the House, wants to ban the use of that uh, by a wide vote on House Bill 314. We'll see what happens in the Senate. Mike, you said uh, our friends over there in Maryland are saying it's going to have a tougher road to go in the Senate. Yeah, sources close to the Tenth Amendment Center. Uh, they they say that. Can we uh, say who those sources are? Ah, <laughs> uh, nah. No, okay, okay. All right. So it's going to be a little tougher. Uh, it's odd in a place like Maryland. Uh, it's well, it's you know this is interesting to me. Just from a, a little aside on on strategy, give people a little inside look at legislatures. This really indicates how much partisan politics often plays into what goes on at state legislatures. Because in the past, a lot of these surveillance bills have been sponsored by Republicans. And in a- When Obama heavily, was in office, right? Yeah, exactly. And in a heavily Democratic uh, legislature like Maryland, uh, even if the people who are in the other party agree with the bill philosophically, they'll kill it just because it's the opposite party introducing it. So now we've got a good bill. Uh, it's been introduced by, by a prominent Democrat from Baltimore. Uh, so that gives it a little bit stronger legs. But from what I understand, there's actually a uh, political division in the Democratic Party in Maryland. So you've got, you know, the Speaker of the House apparently doesn't get along with the Senate president. So sometimes you get uh, infighting there. So these people are killing bills, good legislation for stupid political purposes. And, and that happens a lot more than I think people realize. You know, I think that there's this, this ideological purity that goes on in the legislature. It's a bunch of crap. These people are all a bunch of ideolo- a hacks. Pol- partisan hacks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we know in Maryland that a similar piece of legislation uh, was introduced at least once, if not twice, to deal with stingrays while Obama was in office. I believe it was done primarily by Republicans and then yep. killed. Now, all of a sudden, Trump is in office and it's introduced by Democrats and moving forward. So yep. <laughs> exactly. the same kind of thing happens in all these states. You know, California is now the head of the resistance uh, under the 10th <laughs> Amendment. But, <Right. laughs> I mean, they did stuff against Obama, too. So, I mean, That's California correct. is kind of a weird one there. Like the, yeah. the weed passed uh, when Clinton was in office and the immigration sanctuaries, uh, at least on the state level, was also while it was Obama. But in general, so like in Arizona, for example, we don't see much resistance to Washington, D.C. The same kind of legislation could be introduced that was introduced two years ago, and they're just not touching right. it. Or no. the Fourth Amendment Protection Act, which just uh, was signed into law in Michigan, was introduced and crushed in Maryland when Obama was in office. But right. now it's another way around. So we try to push things more consistently here with which is uh, the people in the states don't need permission from Washington, D.C. to exercise their rights. And this is uh, another positive step forward. Uh, Off to New Hampshire. Mike, this is going to be the last one we're going to cover today. Uh, House Bill 1443, the jury nullification, they call it jury instruction bill, uh, passed the state house by a very close vote. I think it was like 158 to 151. A quick overview of that bill, Mike. So effectively what it will do is allow a defense attorney or a defendant to ask the court to fully inform the jury of its right to not only find uh, you know, guilt or innocence based on the facts of the case, but also to make judgments of law. So it, the, the verbiage specifically allows uh, the jury to know that if they believe that the verdict would be unjust then they have the uh, power, the discretion. I, love, I like the term jury discretion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gives them the discretion to pronounce an innocent verdict, even though the facts of the case may, uh, may deem the person guilty technically under the law. So it allows, it allows the jury to give some judgment to the justice of the law, to the constitutionality of the law, and it just provides the, the discretion the jury, quite frankly, always has, but most often that's hidden from them. Yeah, in some states, they actually uh, aggressively oppose any efforts to try to use jury nullification. They <laughs> they kick people off of juries. They uh, in New York, a prominent activist was arrested just for handing out pamphlets informing potential jurors that they could actually pronounce someone not guilty if they believed the law was unjust. And New Hampshire, I believe, is the only state in the country which specifically has a jury nullification or jury instruction bill on the book. Right. Uh, and this would expand it by specifically. Requ- requiring the judge in the case. Wow, man, they'd have to really eat some crow. Is that the the old school phrase? Eat crow? They'd really have to eat crow if the judge has to sit there 
And while most of them are thinking, I am the final verdict yeah. on in this courtroom, okay, well, even though I may disagree with you or you know, I, the, they've proven that the law was violated, the law as written was violated, well, now I'm telling you, you can actually uh, vote your conscience on this instead if you think otherwise. I mean, that's huge. It uh, is huge. Uh, the New Hampshire Senate is another story. We'll see what happens right. over there. Uh, they've been pushing this for a number of years, Rep. Dan- Daniel Itza and a number of other people. So we'll be following House Bill 1443. Juries have a right and, I believe, a duty to nullify unjust, immoral, unconstitutional acts in the courtroom. It really is the last line of defense. I mean, because right. all this state and individual nullification, uh, when someone still gets arrested, locked up in a cage, uh, if they go to court, uh, I mean, at least they still have another piece of defense if you can convince a jury that uh, uh, to side with you, even if they think that the law was broken. So that's really know, positive. This isn't really a radical idea either. You know, every step of the judicial process the, the players have discretion. You know, the officer has the discretion of whether or not to make an arrest. The prosecuting attorney has the discretion of whether or not to file charges. The judge has a great deal of discretion in the court. The jury has that same discretion, but for some reason, the state doesn't want the jury, the people, to know that they have the same discretion that all of these actors out here have. The you Trump know? administration has discretion to leave the people of Idaho alone, but they're not uh, <laughs> using that discretion, high unfortunately. High well, government likes to have uh, discretion or powers that uh, that they don't want anyone else to have. I mean, what's the old it's saying? Or the new saying? Of course. They don't want humans to have discretion. They want us all to be their little children and be told what to do. Just follow what we've written uh, and this is a very powerful tool to protect liberty in the face of the worst situations where all other steps have failed and someone's been uh, locked up and you can set someone free. So jury nullification is extremely important. If you really want to follow that, we don't uh, do a lot of work on it, uh, but we'll report on legislation. I know there's been some bills filed in West Virginia in recent years. We'll report on it and talk about it from time to time, uh, do a video here and there. But FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org is really uh, the leading source on that. A couple of bills that we're going to uh, keep our eye on in the coming days, Mike. Uh, two raw milk bills. Uh, Alaska House Bill 217 has got a committee hearing and probable vote this week. Uh, another bill to expand raw milk sales in Utah, SB 108, is on the governor's desk. And then in your state, uh, a bill to somewhat restrict drone, sur- uh, drone surveillance is on the Good governor's person. desk. Uh, yeah, especially after uh, Representative Diane St. Ange has pushed for this type of legislation for a number of years and didn't go anywhere. So she got especially a small... With- Considering we have uh, we have senators like Albert Robinson. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that, that, he's he's pretty indicative of our state legislature. So it's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, they're really all like is. that. So House yeah. Bill twenty two on the governor's desk in Kentucky, and so we'll be reporting on those as we get further information. Make sure you. Um, Sign up for our newsletter over at TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash register if you want to get updates. And of course, if you like our work, a membership for as little as two bucks a month is absolutely essential. We got to have some kind of cash to be able to pay the bills. So neither of us have to have jobs during the day, uh, full time day jobs so we can actually do this work. It takes all day, every day, all week, every week. So a couple of bucks a month from uh, hundreds of people makes a big difference. That's 10th Amendment Center.com slash members, of course. Thank you all for watching. Thank you so much for your support. And we'll see you next time here at 10th or Tuesday.